welcome to the international broadcast ministry of No Limits. I am Pastor Delman Coates and here at No Limits, we wanna help strengthen you, encourage you and empower you to feel God's love and to live your life without limitation. Today's message is about to begin and I wanna thank you for watching and know that I'm praying for you to hear a special word from God as you watch. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to Numbers chapter 11, and I want to read in your hearing verses 10 through 17. The word of the Lord reads on this wise. It says, Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, all at the entrances of their tents. Then the Lord became very angry, and Moses was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, why have you treated your servant so badly? Why have I not found favor in your sight? that you lay the burden of all this people on me. Did I conceive all this people? Did I give birth to them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a sucking child to the land that you promised on oath to their ancestors? Where am I to get meat to give to all of these people? For they come weeping to me and say, give us meat to eat and I am not able to carry all of these people alone, all this people alone, for they are too heavy for me. If this is the way that you're going to do me, Lord, then put me to death right now. If I have found favor in your sight and do not let me see my misery. So the Lord said to Moses, Moses, gather for me 70 of the elders of Israel whom you know to be elders of the people and officers over them, bring them to the tent of meeting and have them take their place there with you. And I'm going to come down and I'm going to talk with you there. And I'm going to take some of the spirit that is on you and put it on them. And they shall bear the burden of the people along with you so that you will not bear it all by yourself. Amen. Come on, put your hands together. I just want to read verse 17 again for emphasis. I'm going to come down. I'm going to talk with you there. I'm going to take some of the spirit that is on you and I'm going to put it on some of them and they shall bear the burden of the people along with you. And here's why. So that you will not bear it all by yourself. And I want to talk today, church, from the thought how to handle what you can't handle. All right, all right. How to handle what you cannot handle. Mental health was one of the areas of focus at this year's Winter Olympics. And one of the things that was a cloud over the games was, was the way in which some athletes struggled under the pressure and suffered emotional distress when they did not perform as their coaches and their countries had expected. There was the 19-year-old Chinese figure skater who was met with enormous backlash from her compatriots after falling twice in her Winter Olympics debut in tears. She said that she was upset and, and that she was frustrated by her routine and, and cited that she felt pressure to meet China's expectations. Then there was the 15-year-old Russian favorite, Camilla Valieva, who felt the wrath from her coach only moments af after her less than stellar performance, going from favorite to win the gold medal to being the center of controversy over a failed drug test. Theirs are just a few of the many stories of athletes at this Winter Games and games in the past. Many of you remember Simone Biles just last summer, who reach a point where they feel as if they can no longer take it, as if they are beginning to crack and to crumble under the pressure. Well, I'm addressing this today because knowing how to handle the weight and the gravity of life's challenges, life's trials and troubles is increasingly gaining attention and momentum in today's society. From celebrities, athletes, politicians, and ordinary people alike navigating 
the often treacherous emotional and psychological terrain that comes with work and family and relationships and health and injustice and war and inflation and prices going up is becoming something that all of us are trying to figure out how to handle. Stress and anxiety, church, are normal psychological and physical reactions to the regular ordinary demands of life. Everyone experiences stress every now and then. It's normal to feel anxiety, especially during a crisis, but, but when challenges mount, such as the cumulative effects of this pandemic gathering like a constellation of clouds during a storm, it can push one beyond your ability to cope. And you can find yourself, if you're not careful, feeling, feeling helpless and hopeless, sad and somber, angry and anxious, irritable and afraid. You may have trouble concentrating on tasks, you may find yourself struggling to get out of bed. And if these signs and symptoms persist, changes in your appetite, you should find someone to get help with. But the question I want to raise today is, how do you handle what you feel you cannot handle? Many people are asking that today according to surveys, alcohol use and drug use and overeating, especially during this pandemic, are up as people turn to tried and true vices, hoping to make things better when in reality they are making them worse. The Barna Group reported some years ago that upwards of 1,500 men and women walk away from the ministry every month because of frustration, burnout, and anxiety. And so I've discovered that being a believer does not exempt you from feeling burnout, yes. You can lift up holy hands. You can have reverend in front of your name. You can speak in tongues, but having your name written on the Lamb's Book of Life does not exempt you from feeling as if the weight of the world is on your shoulder. And I thought about that as I reflected on this amazing scene in the Book of Numbers where the great emancipator himself, Moses, one of God's favorite, one of one of our heroes of the faith is heard pouring his heart out to God in agony and frustration. The conversation recorded here is so surreal that one is hard pressed to believe that it is coming from a man who is used as a vessel from God. Moses has been providing faithful leadership to God's people. He has braved the dangerous challenge of re-entering Egypt, the hostile territory, and he, he is now on a rescue mission to deliver Israel and to tell Pharaoh that God said, let my people go. And by Numbers chapter 11, the children of Israel have departed Egypt city limits and are long gone and are found wandering in the wilderness. But when they get there, the people start growing weary and they are extremely frustrated and fatigued. They are ready to get to the long promised and awaited land that God said that they could have so that they could finally have some peace and tranquility. But in accordance with God's purpose and plan, it is not time for them to possess the promise yet. It is not time for them to stop yet. They gotta keep on moving. They gotta keep on walking through the sunshine and the rain, the heat and the hot temperatures, they must run on just a little while longer. And apparently, it got too much for them to handle. Uh, and consequently, the Bible says that they turn on Moses and they start blaming him for where they are and for taking them on this frustrating field trip in which they had to eat the same meals day after day. They are sick and tired of the same older food and they're sensing the that the desert is soon to become a graveyard and it is at that point that the ingratitude and ungratefulness of the people began to test Moses' nerves. He is at a point now by chapter 11 where he has come to his wit's end. His lack of support and appreciation from the very ones he is trying 
trying to help from them lashing from them uh, lashing out at him causes him to now lash out at God in an amazing diatribe that ultimately turns into an effort to renegotiate his contract with God. Moses challenges God about the fact that he is in a no-win assignment and that the people are uncooperative and grateful. So Moses eventually tells God that the weight of leadership is too heavy for him to carry. That's where I'm going. And he astonishingly asks God to take him out of here so that he does not have to witness his own misery and failure. God, I don't want to see how this is going to turn out. God, I don't want to see how this is going to end. And uh, so why don't you just go ahead and kill me now? Have you ever been there? Have you ever felt that you were on the brink of burnout and you didn't know what to do or where to turn? And if I can be transparent for a moment, church, y'all don't mind if I'm transparent. There have been times in my own life when I was just over everything, over work, over stress, over burned, burdened. I was over exhausted. I was just flat out over it. Am I alone in here today? Is there anybody listening to me right now who knows what it's like to be at your wit's end? I have that. I have to understand that there are times when you reach a point where your ability to manage the range of responsibilities are more than you can handle. That the more I try to keep things together, it seemed as if something else was falling apart. I've got one thing together and another thing kept falling off my plate. That the more I tried, the worse things got. And I know I'm not a Alone. I know some of you listening to me right now have been at a point in your own life where you felt as if the more you tried to get things together, the more you tried to get your money and your marriage, your finances and your family together, that things seemed to keep falling apart. And it seemed as if the very people you trying to help started talking about you and stabbing you in the back. Your family, your friends, your children, your husband, your wife, your fa fellow churchmen, the very people uh, you are trying to empower and enable and assist can be the very ones that will try to stab you in the back. Well, for those seeking to navigate such moments in life, I believe that there are some teachable nuggets and some keen insights in this text that can be derived on how to beat anxiety. Yeah, in this passage, there are some tips, there are some clues on how to handle those moments in your life when you cannot handle it. And the first thing this text teaches us is that the path towards a beating anxiety begins with being honest with how you feel. Tell your neighbor, just be honest with how you feel. Now, what I find refreshing about what we're told here is that in this conversation with God, Moses is very transparent with his emotions. And he is very candid and honest with, how, with God about how he feels about this situation. He doesn't sugarcoat anything. He does not filter what he says with God. He's very open and honest with how he feels about his situation. I note that because so many people struggle to get a handle on their anxiety because they are so accustomed to putting a filter on their feelings that they never get real with God or themselves. Did y'all hear me here? So many people mask their unhappiness with religious cliches and rhetoric. We've even created a culture in church where some people believe that being spiritual means being a phony. They say they're fine when in reality they are not fine. Um, they, they, they tell themselves and they tell others that everything is going okay when it is not. And if they are empaths, they are accustomed to pleasing others, even if it's at the expense of harming themselves. 
But Moses here does not do any of that. He does not over-spiritualize how he feels. I like that. He doesn't say he's cool when in fact he's not cool. And I think that ought to bless somebody today because Moses understands that emotional maturity and spiritual growth do not mean that you have to be fake and phony and artificial. He is able to be honest with God because he is able to be honest with him himself. He is hurt. He is disappointed. He's been working hard. He's been burning the midnight oil trying to lead this people and they are not grateful and as a consequence he is frustrated. He's honest with himself and because he's honest with himself he is able to be honest with God and I want to tell someone listening that the path that leads to your breakthrough will start when you learn how to be honest with yourself. Just be honest. As a matter of fact, in most rehabilitation programs like AA, normally the first and initial step towards recovery is admission. Yeah. You've got to acknowledge and admit that you have an issue. You gotta be honest with yourself and be honest with others of where you are. And I might add, when you are honest with yourself and when you are honest with God, it will help you find the courage to be honest with other people, with a pastor, with a close friend, with a therapist, with a counselor, with a loving and trusting confidant. Some of my biggest breakthroughs in life came when I developed the courage enough to admit to close people around me that things were not going as well as they appeared. <laughs> When I went to my parents and I said, Mama, Daddy, I need to talk. Things are not going well in my marriage and it is on the verge of ending. Or when I was able to talk to close friends about how I felt about being ostracized by people and by friends and by colleagues for the stances I had taken. See, just because people appear to be okay on the outside does not mean that they are okay just because they have on nice suits and because uh, they're wearing designer things and put on a big smile uh, does not mean that things are going well. Uh, just because you dress well and just because you're dining well uh, does not mean uh, that you are doing well. Uh, and if you want to get the breakthrough that God has for you, you're going to have to learn how to be honest with yourself so that you can be honest with God so that you can be honest with other people. And the reason being honest with how you feel is so important, church, is because honesty will keep you from at least two major tendencies that can destroy your life. Implosion and explosion. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you understand the importance of being honest because it's going to help you avoid implosion and explosion. Implosion is when you hold it all in so long, you hold it all in so long that week after week, month after month, year after year, you hold it in so long that everything that you're going through starts caving in on you like an avalanche. And in the process, you end up getting buried underneath the rubble when you are holding up your frustration and holding in your fears and holding in your anxiety and holding in your feelings, it can cause you to implode on the inside. You ever see somebody and they were just at the brink. They, they, they were at the edge. I mean, if you pushed them, if you nudged them, they were just on the verge of imploding. But on the other hand, if you don't implode, you'll explode. 
explosion is when you allow what you're going through to cause you to lash out at other people. Now, you ever have a, a, an A-level issue come up, but the but it didn't, but the person's reaction didn't match the, the level of the situation that you what had happened. They've been allowing things to accumulate over time, over the weeks and over the months and over the years, that all of a sudden you ask them about ketchup and they just go ballistic. They, they, they start exploding and they end up damaging other people. They'll start damaging other property and they'll start damaging other relationships in the process. And some of you listening right now are imploders and some of you are exploders. Yeah. And some of you implode on odd months and you'll, you'll explode on even months. You're both. And I've discovered it in your life. You have got to learn how to develop the habit and the art of self-expression. You got to learn the healthy habit of managing your anxiety so that you don't always implode or explode. When many people may find the brashness of Moses' words offensive, I like the fact that Moses is honest with God. I like the fact that he finds a way to unload his feelings to express himself in a healthy a man with God so that he could release the pressure that might otherwise be building up on the inside. And I'm talking to somebody who's got anger management issues. I'm talking to somebody else who is resenting everybody around you. You resent your, you resent your spouse. You resent your children. You resent your, you don't say anything. You smile, but you don't want nobody to touch you. You don't want nobody to hug you. You don't want nobody to kiss issue. They just wondering when we going to have dinner, but you just walking around with your nice self, but, but resenting, imploding on the inside. Moses shows us you got to learn how to unload in a healthy way. And I want to tell you, you can do it by being honest about your feelings. What Moses does here by releasing in a healthy way it's sort of like finding someone to spot you while you're lifting weights at the gym. You ever been there? You ever been trying to lift weights at the gym and, and you, you feel, you know that the weight, the weight on the bar is a bit heavier than you're able to handle? And, 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 but what you do do is you decide to ask somebody else in the gym if they will help you to lift what you're about to carry. And I, I want to tell someone listening that when you get to a point when you're honest with yourself, you send the signal to other people that it is possible for them to help you with what you're trying to handle. See, when you think, when you think about everything you're dealing with right now from financial issues to legal problems to relationship challenges to financial drama I want to ask you how does it make you feel uh, do you sense how you feel do you feel that you have to edit how you feel with your mama with your sisters with your sorority and with your fraternity brothers I want to give somebody permission today to be honest with yourself about how you feel. If the people at your kitchen table and the people you sleep with in bed cannot accept and handle your honesty, perhaps they do not need to be in your circle. I need people in my circle who can handle my honesty. Moses tells God how he feels. And I believe that's key because what Moses discovered is, is that when you are honest with yourself, it'll help you realize your own limitations. See, after telling God how he felt and, and after being honest about it, Moses comes to a key conclusion right here in this text. He realizes that he was trying to carry a weight of all of these people 
by himself. He says that in verse 14. And I believe that's key because it was like realizing, God, I cannot do this by my, I'm trying to help somebody here. And while that might sound like a bad thing to some of you, I think that's the key to the breakthrough. I think that's a good thing, especially for Moses, because God never told Moses to carry the weight of other people's problems by himself. I'm coming to get somebody here. God never told Moses to become responsible for other people's fears and other people's burdens and other people's responsibilities. God never told Moses to take upon himself the responsibility for managing how other people felt about the diet that God gave them. God only told Moses to give leadership to the people, to lead them from their exodus out of Egypt land, Moses somehow had slipped into the self-appointed role in his mind of being their Messiah. <laughs> he had slipped into the self-appointed role in his mind that he was the one who had to carry the burden <laughs> of this nation of people on his shoulders by himself. He slipped into the process of thinking that he was responsible for getting them to follow his leadership into Canaan land. And that was wrong. Preachers got to understand. Pastors have got to understand that this is not your church. God had to deliver me at times from understanding uh, that this is not your church, Delman. Uh, this is my church. Sometimes, sisters and brothers, uh, we have a tendency uh, to take on assignments and to enter into roles uh, for which God has not assigned us to do and God has not anointed us to do and God has not prepared. God has never called us to do some of the stuff that we are carrying around on. Could it be uh, that the weight that we're carrying is a result of burdens that God never asked us to bear? Wow. Could it be that the stress you feel, the anxiety you feel is the result of carrying other people's burdens and, and, and perhaps God allowed this painful development to unfold from Moses so that he could come to grips with his own finality, so that he could come to grips with his own humanity about the fact that he was a human being, he was not God, and that he was not expected to do what only God could do. I'm trying to help someone here. See, oftentimes we get overwhelmed because we fail to realize our own limitations. I know you're the man. I know you're smart. I know you're the head of the household. I know the buck stops with you and that if you don't do it, nobody will. But when you develop a messianic complex for everybody around you, then you fail to establish good boundaries for yourself and other people. When you think you got to do everything, you fail to establish boundaries for yourself and boundaries for your children and boundaries for your, for your, for your siblings. That's why everybody comes to you for everything. Because you don't know how to, y'all not y'all got upset with me. Because you don't know how to set up good boundaries for yourself. And for some of you, everyone keeps coming to you, dumping their problems on your doorstep. See, some of you, you've been saying, why everybody keep coming to me and keep calling me and dumping all of their problems and their finance? Because the reason that happens is because you have attached your value, you have attached your sense of self and importance to thinking that it is your job to fix and to solve everybody. Y'all done got upset with me here today. You have attached your identity, your self-esteem, and your sense of importance on the idea that I got to cook for everybody. I got to iron for everybody. I got to solve everybody's problems. I got to pay. You're going to have a breakdown. You're going to have a nervous breakdown taking other people's problems on yourself. 
And if you're going to get free, you're going to have to disabuse yourself of your delusions of grandeur <laughs> so that you can get a handle on what you can handle. In order for you to get a handle on what you can't handle, you're going to have to disabuse yourself from the idea that you got to do it all. You know, I find out that sometimes life and leadership are a lot like parenting. Some of you who are parents ought to be able to identify with this. A, a lot of times, when you're raising our kids, as they grow older, we want them to make the decisions that we want them to make. Mm -hmm. And we want them to choose what we want. But in reality, we cannot make some decisions for them. I'm trying to help somebody. Sometimes, I've learned this. Sometimes we have got to learn how to release them if we want to help them. I'm trying to bless somebody here today. And we have got to stop taking on other people's lives, even that of our children. I'm trying to help someone here. I remember just, not long ago, just a few months ago, my son Nathaniel uh, wanted a car. I decided I was going to get Nathaniel a car. And I'll never forget sitting Nathaniel down. And I said, Nathaniel, here's the amount of money that I want to spend for this car. Now, you got two options. You can either get a new car, but it's not going to be that popping brand name, you know, brand name that you want. <laughs> but it's going to be brand new. It's going to be reliable transportation. And it's going to last you a long time. After college, it can last you maybe another five, six years after you graduate from college. I believe this will be the best way for me to utilize my investment for your long-term sustainability. Oh, you, you can get a new car, but it won't be that 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 model you know what I mean uh, the other option is you can get a pre-owned car but it's gonna have some miles on it and the reason that's a problem is it's because you're gonna have to take and bear the brunt of the fact that it's all it's time horizon is already gonna be limited it might last another four years for you to get through college but who knows after that and the reason that ought to be something you ought to be concerned about son is because you are now out of my house and when you get out of college you definitely gonna be out of my house like when you graduate from college uh, one of the reasons I'm gonna be jumping up and down and shouting is because I will be finally free from handling all of your responsibilities. So, so I think you got a choice here. You, 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 it is, I think it's wise for you to choose a car that will last a long time versus choosing the pre-owned option that has a limited time horizon. I want to tell you, we went through all the dealerships, we went through all the cars, and we saw the new car, the, the new car, the less, lesser popular model that I thought would have been the best option, and I, and I was trying to make my case, y'all. I was trying to make my case, and Nathan, listen to me for 45 minutes at the dealership make my case on why this should be the best car. And Nathan listened. <laughs> and, uh, and Nathan listened and he said, I said, what you think, son? Can we go back in there and get the car? He said, Dad, I, I hear what you're saying, but I just kind of think you, you're trying to scare me a little bit. I understand what you're saying, but I think, you, I think you're just trying to scare me a little bit. And, and if I get a pre-owned car, the car that I really want, you know, I understand that the time horizon may not be that long, but I'm willing to work. I'm willing to get a little job if it needs repairs. And I'm sitting there saying, son, you're in school. You don't have time. You don't have time to be working while you're in college trying to buy new tires and trying to fix this and trying to fix that. But he said, dad, I'm willing to do it and I was at a dilemma because I had to decide should I get him the car that I want to give him I need y'all to y'all need y'all to follow me here or do I release him and let him make the choice 
Are y'all listening to me here today? And, and, and the Holy Spirit said to me, Delman, you have, you have poured into this boy. You have raised him from the time he was born until he's 19. At a certain point, you're going to have to allow him to go out there in the world, make some of his own decisions, and in the process, he might make some mistakes, but he's going to learn in the process. And when God freed me from being responsible for my child's decision, I could sleep better at night. And God wants me to tell somebody that you got to learn how to release yourself from everybody else's issues. I haven't got a witness here. I want to tell some parent, some mother, some grandmother, some friend that perhaps the weight that you're carrying is a function of the fact that you have not learned how to release some people from the burdens that you're carrying. Have I got a witness in the house today? You got to learn how to release some people. You got to learn how to, how to not carry all these burdens on your own. And, and right here in Numbers chapter 11, Moses has slipped back into a habit that he had done earlier in Exodus chapter 18. You remember in Exodus chapter 18 when Moses had been judging all of the affairs of the children of Israel and his father-in-law Jethro said, Moses, what in the world are you doing? And he said, Dad, look, people are bringing their problems to me, and I guess I got to be the one to handle it. And Jethro told him to tell him, Jethro told him, you are not doing the right thing. You are going to destroy yourself carrying everybody's problems. And I want to tell someone listening here that you, you are not going to get your breakthrough until you learn your lesson to let other people handle their own issues. Look, I know you love your best friend, but perhaps the weight you're carrying is theirs, not yours. I know you love your sister, your brother, but perhaps the bill that you're stressing over it was created by them and not you. I know you love your children, and I know you love your nieces and your nephews, but you have got to understand that you are not helping them. You are hurting them by handling all of their issues. Why are you letting an emergency for other people become an emergency for you? I thank God that I delivered myself from letting other people's problems become a problem for me. Have I got a witness here? Don't you let other people put their burdens on your back. Don't you let other people put your, their problems on your back. You got to realize you got some limitations. Somebody say, I got limitations. You can handle what you can, but you got to let go of what you can't. You got to set your own realistic boundaries, and you got to learn how to say no sometimes. It is okay to say no. Type that in the comments. It's okay to say no. Tell the person sitting next to you, it is okay to say no. Yeah. You do not have to drive them down to South Carolina. You do not have to give them $500. You do not have to cook them, your, their meals for them every day and put it in their freezer. It is okay to say no. Moses is honest with his feelings to God. And in the context of being honest, he realizes, I can't handle all of this by myself. And that's what he had to do. He had to establish some boundaries. And once he discovered some limitations, it helped him to accept help from other people. That's where I'm trying to go. Moses needed to learn the blessing and the benefit of sharing the burden. He needed to learn the sacred art of delegating responsibility that he had taken upon himself. 
See, after telling God that he was ready to die and asking God to pull the trigger, it's amazing how God responds. God responds in verse 16 and following by instructing Moses to find 70 men who are officers and leaders over the people and to meet him at the tent of meeting. And God told him, when you all get there, let them take their stand with you there. And when you all get into the tent of meeting Moses, you don't have to bring bring the Torah. You don't have to bring the Bible. You don't have to write a sermon. God said in verse 17, I'm going to do the preaching. All you have to do is just say amen. And when I'm done preaching, God says, I'm going to give you what you have asked for. I'm not going to take your life. I, need, I got more work for you to do, but I'm still going to take some of what is in you and I'm going to put it on on some of them and they too are going to help you to bear some of the weight that you've been trying to carry by yourself and I think that's amazing that God introduces Moses to an alternative approach to life and leadership so that he can add more years to his life and avoid and escape anxiety and frustration. I'm trying to help some leader. I'm trying to help some parent. I'm trying to help some business owner. God showed Moses that he already had the answer to his problem right around him, that everything he needed was right there near him. All he had to do was to allow God to show it to him. And when he allowed God to show it to him, then he had to allow God to share it with him. For someone listening, God is trying to show you something and God is trying to share something. This, this isn't the last time that Moses will have to deal with frustration. In the coming verses, he has to realize that even his own family members, his sister and his brother, take issue with him. But he's then going to be able to handle it better because he has learned from the test right now. He'll learn how to pass the test in the next chapter because he learned his lesson in this chapter. And if I had a mind, I would have called this sermon, I learned my lesson. <laughs> because Moses reaches a point where he learns that he can't do it all by himself. <laughs> that, he's, that he learns to stop being available for people to put on him what really they ought to handle themselves. Tell your neighbor, I learned my lesson. I'm able to successfully navigate this season because I learned something in my last season. I learned my lesson. I'm successfully able to have to enjoy life now because I learned something in the last chapter. I learned something today. Have I got a witness here? I'm able to stand today because of what I learned yesterday. I'm able to smile this year because of something I learned last year. Yeah, they put it all on me last year. They wanted me to do it all myself last year, but I learned this year. Uh-uh, I'm not going to do it this year. I learned my lesson. I'm going to get out of your way, but I'm reminded of this story of this pastor who happened to be a single father. And one day he attended this pastor's retreat. And during the question and answer period, this pastor and single father raised his hand to ask the facilitator about a struggle he was having. And he said to the facilitator and before the group, I feel like I'm a failure as a father. My wife is deceased and the demands of ministry keep me away from my 12-year-old son. His teacher at school told me the other day that his grades were impacted by his mother's death. And, I, and that I needed to spend more time with him. And so one night, I planned an evening with my boy. When school was over, I had already prepared his favorite meal, and we were just about to sit down to eat when the telephone rang. 
it was the chairman of the deacon board and, and his wife had just had a stroke and he needed me and wanted me to come to the hospital to pray with him. And before I could apologize to my son, the phone rang again and this time it was a young wife who I had just married a few months ago and she was in tears screaming that her husband was leaving her and that he was on his way out of the door. They had an argument or something and, and I looked at my son and I apologized to him solely and then I proceeded to head to the hospital to, to share and to pray with the deacon and his wife and then I rushed over to the home of that couple so that I could try to minister to them and to help them. He told the group that when I got home it was after midnight and when I ran into my son's room there he was asleep on my bed with his head on the pillow and when I pulled off my shoes and my clothes, I was about to pull the cover over his head, but I was struck that the pillow was soaked with my son's tears. The man tearfully repeated to the group and to the facilitator, I feel as if I'm such a failure as a father. And the facilitator calmly replied to the man by saying, Sir, you're not failing as a father. You're failing as a pastor. Because if you're the only person in your ministry who can go and pray with someone whose loved one is sick, and if you're the only one who can intervene in the middle of a domestic dispute because a man and his wife are struggling to get, uh, together, you are not failing as a father, sir. You're failing as a pastor. Church. The way to handle what you cannot handle is to be honest with how you feel, to recognize your own limitations, and to accept help from others so that you can be available to God and to be the man and woman of God that the Lord would have you to be. Come on, put your hands together and give the Lord some praise today. So many people are wrestling with anxiety today. People are at their wits' end. So much is happening in the world. We see what's happening on the news. Then we have to manage what is happening on our jobs and what's going on at the grocery store. We look at the balances on our bank account. And then issues come up with the kids and in the family and relationships. And we struggle with just trying to keep it all together. Well, I want to tell you, that if you want to handle what you can't handle, just be honest about it. You don't have to perpetrate and act as if you got it all together. Just be honest with how you feel. Be honest with God. Be honest with others. That's going to help you to come to the realization that, you know what, I've got some limitations. There are some things that I cannot do and some things that I just can't handle. And guess what? It's okay. People try to put their their perspectives on me all the time about what a pastor and what a preacher should do. And I said, oh, man, I'm glad your pastor back home did that. I'm glad my pastor back home did that too. But I can't do that. Don't take other people's burdens and put it on yourself. And that's going to free you. It's going to liberate you to then accept the assistance of other people. That's going to help you to handle what you can't handle. Here at No Limits, we want to do everything we can to help you get the most out of each message preached on the broadcast. That's why we created a free sermon viewing guide for each message. The viewing guide contains some commentary, the key points from the message, some space for note-taking, and questions to consider throughout the week. You can request your free copy of the sermon guide by going to our website at delmancoats.org. That's delmancoats.org and clicking on the watch tab in the menu at the top of the page. From there, you can view any message from our archives and download the sermon guide for that message before you watch. Thank you for tuning in today, and I pray the message blessed and encouraged you as you strive to live a life with no limits. Join me as we travel to Egypt and Dubai in the spring of 2023. Together, we will explore the Great Pyramids of Giza and learn the hidden history of one of the world's greatest ancient civilizations. We will cruise the ancient Nile like the pharaohs once did 
and disembark at iconic sites such as the Aswan Islands, the Valley of the Kings, and the famous Egyptian Museum of Antiquities. And after we've explored Egypt, we will head to Dubai and explore this great modern city. This is truly the trip of a lifetime, and I hope that you'll join me on this journey. Go to delmancoats.org for more information and to register. But don't delay, as space is limited on this tour. I want to thank you for watching today, and I'll see you right here next week for a new episode of No Limits. I am so glad that you took the time to watch this message today. If you have been blessed by this outreach, I'd like to ask you to become a partner in this ministry so that together we can reach the world for Jesus Christ. My heart is to reach people just like you all around the world and to tell them that God loves them and wants to empower them to live a life with no limits. Your financial investment in this ministry will enable us to spread the good news of Jesus Christ around the world so that more people can be inspired and encouraged. Will you help me to reach those people? Will you join me in empowering the lost and the forgotten? Will you be my partner as we teach people to truly live a life with no limits? To make a donation safely and securely, go to our website at delmancoats.org. That's delmancoats.org. And look for the donate button on the top right of the homepage. Thank you in advance for your support and for becoming a true partner in No Limits. Your partnership and financial gift will help us impact the world by bringing hope to those who need it. Your generosity today is a reminder of the goodness of God. Thank you again for watching No Limits with Pastor Delman. The preceding program was brought to you by the faithful supporters of No Limits and Mount Enon Baptist Church in Clinton, Maryland.